Dear family and friends of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, may God's grace, mercy, and peace dwell with you now and forevermore. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Most gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the great and abundant gifts that you give us each and every day. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would faithfully, faithfully use these gifts to bring honor to you. Lord, help us to always have an attitude of gratitude, knowing the generosity with which you have shown us your love. Lord, help us always to reflect on your resurrection, the promised hope that we have, that one day as you have risen and conquered death, that we too shall arise. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I don't know about you, but growing up, we had certain things that we would have pretty often. Certain foods that we would have in the house that, well, it was mostly because they were able to stretch the budget a little further. But now, even today, I enjoy these foods. I think the term for these foods are what we call comfort foods. Does anybody have comfort foods? Things that they really like today that draws your memories back to when you were a little child or maybe even a little bit older. Maybe it's macaroni and cheese or maybe like mine is, uh, is uh, spaghetti. My, when we were almost out of money, I could always tell because spaghetti was going to be on our plates. Because you can make lots of spaghetti. You can water down the sauce and get pretty far with a, with a can of sauce. And all of us still had full tummies. Now that's what my mom usually made for us. Now, when uh, my dad was cooking, he had a little different uh, go-to. He would go to cheese, bread, and butter, and sometimes if we had a little extra, we'd have a little tuna, and we'd have uh, grilled cheese or tuna melts. Anybody like those? I still love grilled cheese. But I imagine that my comfort food of grilled cheese is a far cry from what I might get at the Serendipity 3 restaurant in New York City. They serve a grilled cheese sandwich there. And let me tell you about this grilled cheese sandwich. It is made with French Pullman bread, champagne bread. And the champagne bread is made from Dom Perignon and is infused with 24 karat gold flakes. I would imagine that gets stuck in your teeth, but I've never had it, so I don't know. Well, after that, and I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation here, but they put on this cheese. It's called Cacciavallo, uh, uh, and I'm going to have to read the Polalico. And, well, I don't, can't pronounce the cheese because it's from Italy, but let me tell you about this cheese. It comes from these Podolica cows. There's only 25,000 of them in the world. And they only are able to produce milk from May to June, so a very short period, a very rare cheese. These cows, they are grass-fed, and they are on, and the grass that they eat in southern Italy is grass that is filled with wild strawberries and, and fennel and has uh, all kinds of delicious aromas that come out in the cheese. And then they put the sandwich together, spreading grass-fed white truffle butter on both sides of that thick Pullman bread. They cook it, and they serve it on a, some crystal pl a crystal plate. And with that crystal plate, you get a little dipping sauce, Southern African lo to lobster tomato bisque. Now, I imagine maybe some of you are a little hungry. Oh, I almost forgot. When they're cooking the sandwich, they gild it with more 24 karat gold flakes. Doesn't that sound delicious? Is anybody ready for lunch? You know, we should end the sermon right now and get moving. Well, the reason I'm aware of this culinary creation is not because I've recently been to New York City, but it actually made the news at the end of last year because the Serendipity 3 restaurant was awarded Guinness Book of World Rest Records most expensive grilled cheese sandwich. Did you know they had that award? I didn't know they had that award. But if you would like this sandwich, you can go to New York City and you can pay $214, $214 for one sandwich, and you have to warn them 48 hours in advance that you're coming. Now, I don't know about you. Like I said, I don't know if the gold flakes get stuck in your teeth or whatnot, but I can't imagine most of you are going to go to New York City and buy this sandwich. Maybe some of you, but I don't think so. Maybe even if you're going to New York City, the sandwich is not on your list of I have to have sandwiches. But the reason I bring up the sandwich to you is because I think it actually captures very well the sin of gluttony. Not because I imagine that any of you are going to spend over $1,000 to have five of these sandwiches or something like that and le leave feeling completely stuffed, but actually because gluttony is not just about overeating. And I need you guys to remember that because a lot of people think that gluttony is just about how much you eat. It's about how much a person put, consumes and whether or not they consume too much, if they eat too much or drink too so, uh, much. But gluttony actually has a greater root sin to it. And if you think about it, in our own English language, 
We know that gluttony is not just used for food. Think about this. Have any of you ever heard or used the phrase, a glutton for punishment? Well, probably you've at least heard it. Someone who perseveres through the pain, they push and push, and the greater the pain, the more that they've worked through. Or what about this? If there are too many widgets on the market or other products on the market, we'll call that a glut on the market, right? Or even, let's use a biblical example. In Luke chapter 7, when Jesus recounts the fact that the Pharisees accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard, they didn't actually, weren't accusing him of eating too much. We never see that Jesus had a problem with consuming too much food or drinking too much wine. And in fact, if we look at the text, we realize that their accusation is the fact that they were accusing Jesus of having a loose and a licentious lifestyle, that he was being too abundantly loving to those prostitutes, those tax collectors, those sinners. Really, gluttony brings us around to squandering that which God has given us. Gluttony refers to those who do not faithfully use the gifts of God. And to kind of show you what I mean here, the root of the word gluttony is actually a Hebrew word, zalal. And the root of that is zalal, and, and it means one who quakes or one who trembles or shivers. And it can mean one who squanders. One who squanders. Someone who's unstable. Someone who has no self-control or self-discipline. So it could be someone who eats too much. But it could also mean many other things as well. Because it means being self-indulgent. Replacing God as center and my pleasure takes over. What do I want? What would make me most happiness? Fills that gap in our hearts. Instead of putting God as the center of our lives, we put ourselves there. So when we look at that sandwich, well, maybe it's not the fact, maybe e eating one of those sandwiches wouldn't be so wrong. But it is geared towards someone who is self-indulgent, someone who has money bur to burn, to waste, someone who is not using that which God has given them faithfully. Now, I need to stop here for just a moment, and I need to make sure I reassure you of something. God does not desire that we live an ascetic or plain lifestyle. He wants us to enjoy his creation. He wants us to enjoy the blessings he's given us. That's not what I'm saying here. It, sometimes we can treat ourselves to things, a, a piece of chocolate cake, a, a delicious $214 sandwich. But this is what gluttony refers to is an attitude. This is an attitude, a re regular attitude in life. An attitude that is more about th myself than about God. And this is destructive to our relationship with God, and it is destructive to our relationship with others, because this asks the question of what brings me the most pleasure, and that's what gluttony is about, is what brings me the most pleasure, and it becomes all about me, and not about how I might live my life to honor God, to serve others. Now Jesus, he kind of, he actually gets at very succinctly the, the sin here. Just right before our gospel today, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Matthew 6, 21. Many of you know that, by, that verse by heart. And if you know the verse, you know he's referring to material things and to greed. But gluttony and greed are closely related. Because greed focuses us on that material, those material things. But gluttony focuses us on those, those emotional things, those things that build us up and those things that bring us pleasure and comforts. And so the gluttonous person could be someone who eats too much, but it could be any number of sins. It could be a person, who, a person who works and works and works, who doesn't take time for God or his family or his loved ones, who continually puts work first. It could be a person who works out where she can never be satisfied with the image that God has given her, the body. So as often as she looks in the mirror, she keeps working out, never appreciating the blessings of God can refer to someone who puts things into their body that they know they shouldn't, cigarettes or, or abundance of alcohol, drunkenness, a whole other sin. That's a different uh, sermon. But gluttony shows, its, way, shows its, its head in many ways in our lives. It rears its ugly head in our hearts and even in Christian lives. And what about you? Are there any pleasures in this life that you just can't do without? Are there any pleasures in this life where you just feel you have to have them? Because that's what gluttony does. Gluttony not only is destructive to our relationship because it puts us at the center, but a glutton never has enough. 
A glutton never can be fulfilled. And this is destructive towards our trust to God as well. Jesus answers this trust in our gospel, this, answers this distrust in our gospel this morning. And he exhorts us to trust God. He says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Our focus is not meant to be on what brings us pleasure, but on what brings honor to God. Our focus is not meant to be on well, how we fill our, our bellies, how we fill our lives with the, the many good things in this world, but how we honor God with what he has given us, the blessings that he has given us in this life. How do we honor God with all that he has given us? And that's a good question to ask. Because we know that every good gift God has given to us, every good gift that we have is a generous gift from God. Look back at Matthew 6. Jesus, he takes these simple examples. The birds of the air, the flowers of the field, the lilies, he says in this text. Luke is not as specific. Luke is specific and says the sparrows, but sorry, I digress. But more importantly, he takes these simple examples and shows how God takes care of them. And how much more will he take care of you? You, his children, you, his sons and his daughters. How much more will our God look after you and take care of your physical needs? Even when we forget to pray for him, even when we forget to thank him. And even sometimes when things don't seem to be going our way, when we struggle to make ends meet, when we struggle to pay our bills, we still have a promise, a great promise from God that he will provide for us more than we can imagine because we are his sons and daughters. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul reminds the Galatian church of just the generous gift God has given to us. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might redeem adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You are heirs to God's kingdom. You are heirs to the, most great, the greatest gift in the world, beyond this world. Now there are times in this life where we struggle with our faithfulness to God, even knowing this promise. There are times in our lives where, things we, will, where we will think that we don't have all we need. But God promises us He will provide. And He has kept His promise. Because he has provided for us salvation. He kept the very first promise he made to us. The promise that we would join him in eternity. And by his son's precious death on the cross, our sins were paid for. By his resurrection, we now have a right in God's kingdom. We are sons and daughters. We are legally. That word, term adoption is a legal term. We are God's sons and daughters. And so we have a greater gift than is even comparable on this earth. We have a greater gift than we can imagine. God won't only take care of what we need on this earth, but he promises us a life with him in eternity that is beyond imagination. Now, Paul, he says, he says that he had to learn contentment. And contentment is the act opposite of gluttony. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he said that he learned to be content in all things. And I think it's important we remember that. Because this change doesn't happen over, overnight. But contentment with God comes in trusting Him. Trusting Him over and over again. Trusting that He will fulfill His promises. Re seeing how He has in the past. Seeing how He is right now. Looking to the future and recognizing where He is leading us and the way that He is caring for us. Earlier this week, Carla and I and Jacob are, took in two kittens that we are fostering. Now, these kittens are only two weeks old, and I did not know what I was getting into. But I tell you about these two kittens, because the very first night we had them, they did not trust us at all. They were scared de nearly to death. When we held them in our hands, they were shaking. Even when we covered them up, they were shaking. When we tried to feed them, they would, we had to really sho shove the syringe in their mouth so that they could eat. And it was very difficult. Now that we've had them a few nights... They're starting to trust us. Trust that we're going to feed them. Trust that we're going to take care of them. They had to learn to trust us. We have to learn to trust God. 
in order to find contentment in this life, we have to learn to trust God, to trust that He will provide. And it is a daily relationship with God of trusting Him, recognizing His hand at work. And that is where contentment comes. Contentment comes in recognizing all that God does for us. And I know that's not an easy thing to do. Because there are so many things that we struggle against in this life. But when we have that contentment, when we learn contentment in in all things as Paul learned, then we'll also know the peace of God. We'll know the peace of being his sons and daughters. The peace that he has prepared a place for us. The peace that as his children, we will one day rest secure. Now may the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please pray with me. Most gracious Lord, we do give thanks to you for the many gifts that you have given us in this life. For the generosity that you have shown to us poor, miserable sinners. For the gift of salvation that you have adopted us as your sons and daughters, making us very heirs to your kingdom. Lord, help us each day to live as your children, living faithfully in service to you and honor to you, recognizing that every good gift is a gift from you. Lord, we thank you for the joys of this life, for the ways in which we enjoy your creation. Help us always use the blessings you have given us, though also to share with others, to care for others, to to reflect your love to others. Lord, we thank you that we look forward to the day when we will know true contentment, when we will be in your loving embrace in life eternal. Until that day comes, may you lead us, may you guide us, may you direct us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.